Thank you. Uh, so we'll, we'll make this quick because I know uh, we're, we're keeping you from lunch. Um, so what is workplace violence? I hope everyone has seen this uh, definition. Um, and primarily, I think what most of us see is that type two violence where it's the, uh, the patient on our staff. Um, and here's some good stats. Uh, it's always fun to share. Uh, hopefully we realize that healthcare workers are four times more likely to be a victim of workplace violence. We have the highest rate of uh, violence uh, more than any other industry, more than corrections, more than law enforcement. Uh, it happens frequently, unfortunately. Now, I don't know if anyone's seen this survey conducted by the American College of Emergency Physicians last year, um, but it has some good numbers. 51% of those, uh, more than half say patients have been physically harmed. Uh, half of emergency physicians have been physically assaulted at work. Six in 10 of those assaulted say it's been in the past year. Um, and what does this do? It impacts our physician retention recruitment, impacts our nursing recruitment, um, especially nowadays with unemployment being, I think, what, less than 3%. Nurses can pretty much work anywhere, so they're going to choose to work somewhere where it's safe. Um, and it impacts our worker comp claims, lost time, insurance costs. And when you start looking at the dollars, uh, Milliman did a report back in 2017. It affects our industry $2.7 billion a year. Um, and I think, you know, when we talk about staffing a lot of times, who, who struggles with getting staffing? Just me? Everyone, everyone's got great staffing in their security departments? Um, but these are the type of numbers you're able to take back and, you know, talk about because um, security is not a, uh, a revenue generating department. Uh, it's, a, it's a cost. And how do you justify those costs? And you justify those costs by reducing risk. I'm gonna save us money by hiring a couple more people. The great state of California, we like to lead uh, the country in a lot of legislation. Uh, if you have straws, you're gonna lose those soon. We're already getting rid of them, phasing them out here. Uh, but we passed uh, 1299, it's now the law, it's uh, 3342, and it defines what hospitals are required to do when it comes to workplace violence. Why is that important? Uh, because in February and March of this year, uh, the same exact law went before U.S. Congress and the Senate, uh, currently in committees, and it has a lot of support from unions uh, to get this passed. Um, and what's the impact? You're going to re be required to train 100% of your staff every single year when it comes to workplace violence. Think of that cost. Um, it's no small feat. Eight states already have uh, laws requiring workplace violence. Um, and what can you do to reduce it? Uh, a lot of this is pretty common sense, right? Assess the risk, um, discuss incidents, find out you know, root cause, what happened, how do we stop that from happening again? Add some security measures, control access, panic alarms, uh, the design, identification of safe areas, training, things like that. Maybe just to ask a question here that you were trying to ask earlier, it's hard to see. Um, who has responsibility for security operations, if you could raise your hand? And just to expand upon the question about staffing, what does that look like for you? How do you think about staffing? What are your concerns? Do you have too many officers? <laughs> How do you manage it? Well, mine's all outside. I, I work outside. Third party? Okay. Third party. All right. How about in the back there? In our, area, in our area, the uh, it's not it hasn't been difficult to find former police, former military who will work these jobs. It's actually been just us meeting the pay to match the market. Mm -hmm. I think there, the lady behind you. Did you have a responsibility also? Yeah, we brought ours in house. We used to do contract, and it was not working. Um, so we are self-employed. Um, and then we contract with off-duty officers to have an armed guard in our ED 
um, which has helped dramatically. We are, our security officers do not carry um, guns. They only carry tasers. Do you feel like you need more officers or how do you determine the right staffing level? We definitely need more. Um, and it's probably the same as it always has been. And we don't really have a good algorithm for proving that we need more. Mm -hmm. we, we had uh, an incident, a uh, series of incidents that happened at a small hospital, mostly rural area and uh, behavior health focused hospital. And a series of events had occurred, and it got to a point of uh, um, frustration with the local leadership that they asked for 4.2 more FTEs for security. And <laughs> so at a small hospital, 4.2, that was probably about a, I don't know, 30% increase from where they were at. And how do you think a health system's thinking about those requests today? Obviously, there's a concern and passion to support in preventing workplace violence. There's obviously a role for law enforcement. Uh, or, or security, um, either in-house or third party. But how do, you, how do you make a case for those officers? What's your benchmark? We struggled with that uh, tremendously. Um, and what we ended up doing was thinking about it from a, a staffing model from an industry benchmark, um, IHAS, International Association for Healthcare Safety and Security, I think I have that right? Yeah. Or maybe I got a couple things security backwards. Security safety. Yes. Yeah. We just say IHAS. We, they've, they've got like a fifth generation um, benchmarking tool that they've um, developed. And they've refined it, of course, five times. And that's the tool that we relied on heavily. We put it into a little spreadsheet. We put in our current state. We put in all of our metrics. They don't just think about it in how many square feet of facilities do you have, right? Which is actually what our workforce planning team was pushing back on us for when we requested those FDEs. At that hospital, we actually got feedback from the workforce planning team that said you have three times as many officers as you already uh, as what you need according to our industry benchmark. I'm like, well, what's your industry benchmark? Number of officers per 10,000 square feet. Doesn't matter what type of facility we have. Doesn't matter about calls for service, any of that stuff. The IHAS model considers not just square footage. Keep me honest here. Yeah. Licensed beds. Uh, if you use officers to sit on patients which is not something I see a lot, but if you're doing that, it includes those hours. Do you have a behavioral health unit? It doesn't consider the size of the unit, but it says whether you have it or not. Um, whether you have a trauma center designation. And then the last one, I think, is whether you have both, trauma center designation and behavioral health. And so they'll give you an industry benchmark. And when you do that across all of your locations, and you can sort of see where you're red, yellow, green from a staffing level, it allows you as a leader over that space to advocate pretty um, uh, reliably on, on how you should think about your staffing levels. And I stress that so much just because I think of all the things that are on this board and that we can talk about for the rest of the, um, rest of the day, um, the correlation between staffing levels of officers and this idea of having a really quick response time, how those officers are trained, what they're instructed to do, what their duty belt has, the more you can create standards around that and have an appropriate staffing level has been um, a primary focus for us. Yeah, I mean, like, so for instance, my hospital, we are in South Central Los Angeles uh, on the site. I mean, right, we're right next to the old Martin Luther King Jr. Community Hospital. You might have heard of it uh, in the LA Times about a decade ago. If you've ever seen a, a movie from South Central, um, Boys in the Hood, that, that is the area where we're at. Um, 131 beds. We were contract security. We brought that whole thing in-house. And during that process, we went through and met with the stakeholders. We met with the clinicians. We met with physicians. We met with the directors of those, those teams and said, you know, what is it you're looking for? Because at the end of the day, from a security standpoint, our customers are the staff. Um, they're there to ensure that they're safe. Um, and when it goes back to, you know, talking about retention and recruitment, uh, our ED had an 80% traveler volume. So 80% of our ED uh, when we were transitioning was was travelers. We couldn't hire people to save our lives. And part of that was they didn't feel safe. You know, who wants to come work at a hospital if you don't feel safe? Um, so when we, when we met with them, we, we kind of did the same thing. Uh, but we took it a step further. We also used our incident rates to determine, you know, what, what staffing model do we need? Um, and I'll be honest, so we are blessed. We were, we were very lucky. We did a very good job. 131-bed uh, hospital, and we have 72 FTEs in our security department. Um, 
So I know that's that's unheard of, and I don't think anyone's going to go back home and you know go go and get that kind of FTE count raised up. Um, but it, you know, we, we were lucky. Uh, but my peers that I talk with, they're they're doing the same thing, just gradually increasing the, to get there. And a, and a big thing for us is not me going and saying we need these FTEs. But when I have the the ER, the, the, the chair for the ER physicians go and say, hey, we need another security officer because this is what we're trying to do and this would be good to have that presence. Um, you know, that, that helps. It's not me trying to sell it. Now I have the physicians helping me sell it. I have the, the, the clinical directors going in and saying, hey, we need some help here. Let's, uh, let's add another officer because the staff don't feel safe or they want to see a, a better presence. Um, and we did away with static posts or, you know, put a guy at this desk and that's all he does is sit there for eight hours. Um, we, we got people up moving around, making rounds through the hospital. And the other thing about that rounding is it's not just we walking through. Um, it's purposeful rounding. They're stopping at those nurses stations. They're interacting. How's everything going? Um, you know, patient in 402, how's he been? I know we had an issue with him yesterday. What's going on this morning? Is everything good? So that way, we're going in and checking. Uh, we'll, we'll walk in the room and ask the patient how he's doing too. So that way, the patient gets the visual that security's there. Um, and that visual deterrent really does play quite a bit to help reduce those incidents. Because sometimes they think if there's no one around, I'm going to get away with it. Uh, but if they see it, then they know like, well, it's, they're, they're probably not going to try that because there's, there's a guy here. In order to develop a habit of doing that too is, is um, when we started out at my previous employer with that model, it was about really being analytic and tracking it, putting it on a performance board. Where are you supposed to round? Did you round there? Yes or no? What was the nurse's name that you talked to? Are you developing a trusting relationship with that person? Right? So that when you do come around and round and the nurse is busy and the rooms are full, and you ask the nurse, is there any needs you have? The first reaction is generally, no, everything's good. Oh, wait, but what about 402? If you could just stand in the threshold of the door and just say, hey, Joe, I'm here uh, from security. I'm just here to, to help. Uh, do you need anything? The re it's kind of a rhetorical question because you probably catch them uh, off guard. It's a little bit of a, I'm here to serve you, but I'm also here. <laughs> um, and we found a lot of success with that. And at the core, and that's why I go to the staffing levels. If you don't have good staffing levels, you're never going to have the time to develop those trusting relationships going to the locations where nothing's happening and having time to do that. Uh, and the other thing that we're doing really big, I mean, and so this is required by the law, but we're training our staff on de-escalation techniques. Um, they're getting educated on the assault cycle. And when I say our staff, I'm, I'm talking to everybody from physicians, which obviously trying to get physicians training is, is a struggle. Um, apologize if there's any physicians in the room. Um, but their time is very valuable. They don't want to waste it, you know, sitting in some class. Uh, all the way down to, I mean, the, the janitors, EVS, uh, dietary, everyone that's interacting with those patients, they're getting that, that training. One, so they can identify that the aggression cycle um, quickly before, you know, it gets to that stage where now we have violence occurring, right? We want to prevent it. Um, and then two, it gives them the techniques on how they should react if they encounter a violent situation. Uh, you know, and it's pretty standard stuff. Like, uh, don't put yourself, uh, don't put the patient between you and the exit, right? Uh, you want an escape route to where if it goes bad, you're, you're able to. Don't go in closed rooms one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Keep the door open. That way, if you could yell out, someone's going to hear you. Try not to be isolated, things like that. Maybe before you go on, one last thing about the risk assessments is we're moving in a model to try to do the same risk assessment, assessment across all of our ministries. And then with that, we're earmarking some dollars out of our, our dedicated facility infrastructure pool specifically for security. I mean, just like you're trying to compare replacing a roof to a new project and you never get the roof done, um, if you don't earmark some dollars for security things, and it can be you know, changes to the reception area to provide two means of egress. It can be uh, access control hardware for doors and all those things. But if you can think about just earmarking that and then sort of having a debate amongst your facilities, uh, or excuse me, your security teams, with a risk assessment done, um, you've got a chance to have a, a purposeful um, process, risk ranking the things, and you know that you're going to have some money to do it at the end of the day. And it's kind of hard because you always want more money in facility infrastructure, but um, if, you, if you try to advocate for the one-off door access every time, it can be a little bit uh, frustrating as well. And it, and it kind of goes to that. Um, and I would say when you're designing these spaces, try to keep you know, some of that in mind. Um, I like this picture right here because this, this looks like a typical nurse's station. I think most of our hospitals probably have. 
Um, and what, what sticks out to me is we have these beautiful uh, vases with some flowers. Um, it looks nice, but if, you know, if you imagine uh, that visitor is not quite happy because his wife's not getting the care he thinks they need, and he's trying to express that, and maybe the nurse is having a bad day and you know overworked and super busy and not really paying him the attention he wants, he's going to tend to act out. And what, when he acts out, the first thing he's going to do is probably grab that vase because it's right there. Um, we don't notice it day in and day out, but that's that's the potential. So kind of like educating staff about some things, you know, maybe move that base to the back where he doesn't have access. Um, we talk about sufficient staffing, um, and that's that's who can maintain order. You know, if you have an assault occurring, who's who's coming to the rescue, and how long does that rescue take? Uh, I know one of my peers uh, in Orange County. They have one security officer in their ED 24-7, one. And it's a 50-bed ED. Um, so primarily, it's, it's the facilities that's you know, getting the call on the radio, dropping what they have going to respond and help this uh, security officer out. Because I mean, at the end of the day, what's one security officer going to do against maybe a 246-foot one uh, guy who's super not happy? Maybe coming off PCP or a behavioral health issue or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so have those plans and have those designs and try to get your staffing uh, sufficient to be able to deal with that. I think everyone's familiar with the, uh, the facility guidelines, the FGI, right? Uh, on the right is also the IHSS security design guides, design guidelines for healthcare facilities. I'd recommend uh, you purchase this, take a look at it. Uh, it's always easier when we design it from the beginning and you know keep security in mind than it is to now go back and uh, well just open the wall back up because we want to put access control. Let's uh, let's get the ceilings open back up because we want to add a camera over here, things like that. So if we can kind of have that in mind from the beginning, I think it, it plays a big part. I'm a big fan of as the PDC team is delivering a project like at the SD phase, there's a physical signature by plan operations and security that they've reviewed the plans and have participated to a level they feel comfortable. Uh, do it later than that, you're running into trouble. Um, so in addition to the guidelines, just the particulars that are going on in that facility, um, just pausing and letting your director of, of security or, or whomever's in the physical, uh, physical security design space uh, participate in that. That was the biggest issue when I, when I came on to MLK is we, we were brought in at the very end. Being like, oh yeah, uh, by the way, security, uh, what, what is it you're going to want? Well, we're going to want access control on this door, this door, this door. We want a camera right here in this hallway. Oh, uh, we, uh, when we scoped the project out, we didn't remember security. And so the budget doesn't have that in there. Um, so yeah, shame on them. I mean, our project manager, uh, he now had to go find the money because... It's, it's got to happen, uh, but it helps to have, have those means at the forefront. Uh, and then threat assessments. Threat assessment teams are probably the next big wave when it comes to workplace violence and what we'll see. Um, using assessment tools, decision trees, algorithms, build it into your uh, electronic health record. Um, so a patient, when they present in our ER, uh, right away when they're at triage, there's about six or seven questions that we go through. And, the, and we use Cerner, and Cerner automatically scores that now and determines if they're going to be a threat, if there's a potential for violence from this patient. And, you know, it's pretty standard questions. You know, do you feel like hurting yourself? Do you feel like hurting others? Um, and it's part of our suicide uh, risk screening tool as well. Uh, you know, are you, on a scale of 1 to 10, are you angry? And how angry are you? And those, those potential things. And then what it does is it flags the, the health record. So any nurse or any physician, when, when they pull that chart up, there's a, an asterisk right in the top corner that identifies, hey, uh, just, just a heads up, this uh, patient is not having a good day or has some potential. Or, you know, in here, here two days ago, uh, visiting our ER, because we have those frequent flyers, uh, they, they spit on somebody or they didn't like their bologna sandwich, it took too long to get, and so they acted out. Uh, we took that a step further, though, because not all staff have access to, uh, to Cerner. Uh, our EVS aren't exactly checking the, uh, the patient file before they go and clean the room. So uh, just like, I mean, how many of you have uh, fall risk patients? 
two, three. All right, you might want to get with uh, your clinical staff because you should probably have a better handle on that. Um, so we all have fall risk patients, but with that, you know that every door, every patient room that you walk into, I guarantee there's a, a deal on the side that you know has a little sticker or a code or uh, whatever it is, identifying that they're a fall risk. We do the same thing for, uh, for violence. Uh, so if you score high enough and we determine that you're a risk, we'll put a deal on the door. Um, at first, uh, our fifth floor used the Angry Bird. Uh, we didn't think that was quite appropriate, so we changed that up to a, a, a silver leaf, because in California we use code gray, that's an assaulted patient. Uh, so we throw that up there, and uh, now anyone walking in that room has that quick visual that, hey, there's a potential violent patient, probably shouldn't go in here by myself, let me grab a buddy, uh, or have somebody maybe call security and they can come up and do a standby while I'm in here. Uh, we've also taken a step further and we do this on our visitors. Uh, we track all our visitors, uh, scan their driver's license, give them a badge, take their picture, gather their data a little bit, um, and then if they have issues, we, we track that and log it for the next time that they come by. We thought we had a lot of visitors. Uh, we were just handing out like little stickers uh, when they first walked in. And we thought maybe we're doing about 3,000 a month. And then when we got the actual visitor management system, we realized we we're doing over 10,000 visitors a month. Uh, so quite a big difference. And then communication. I, I think communication is key just about any business, any, anything we do. So just make sure that we're passing these uh, issues on to, to our peers. When we, when we go home, someone else knows about it, things like that. Just a comment on that. There's a part of this whole workplace violence thing that's not around the data. It's not around... Uh, the physical security environment sometimes. It's not around the staffing level, but it's this concept that 90% um, of the, the role of a security department, for example, I feel is about reducing stress and anxiety, right? Because 10% of the time you're probably in something that's pretty meaty, an actual altercation or post-incident. But how do you deal with 90% of the other things or 90% of the other time? And this idea, how do you reduce stress and anxiety? I think being, you know, having officers present and having that trusting relationship that I talked about earlier is, is important. But one of the examples I would share with you is um, we had one hospital that took it on their own to print out a sign that basically says we don't tolerate workplace violence and you, know, you can be prosecuted, right? This is a healing environment. We're here to, here to help you. And they just started printing them out and putting them in the hospital. And that turned into a conversation of, well, should they have done that? Why did they do that? Is that the right message? Marketing gets involved, there's legal involved, and all this kind of stuff. Does it say zero tolerance policy, or what does it say? Um, we debated that for months, no joke. And at one point before we um, sort of were going to make a final decision on it, one of the, the chief medical officers said, well, what's your data that proves putting a sign up reduces workplace violence? Well, there was no data, right? So my message to you is part of the way we have to think is about just reducing stress and anxiety. And if staff feel like that sign on the wall allows them to point to it in the right situation or that visitors are going to look at it and it has even some marginal impact, what's the cost of a piece of paper put in a little plastic sleeve hanging on the wall? Right? So there's no data for it. Should we do it or not? I don't know. But at the end of the day, if staff want it and they feel like it's effective, then there's a component to reducing stress and anxiety. And while there might not be data, it is an industry best practice. Uh, Loma Linda University has a great sign -in that they put up. Uh, you can find it online. Uh, the verbiage they use, I think, is very clear. Uh, it also, it, it, two messages, it kind of goes to the, the patients and visitors so that they're aware on notice, but it goes to supporting the staff so the staff feel that, that support and know that uh, we don't tolerate it. A lot of the state hospital associations have standard forms. You can go on their website and grab them too customize them for your location. I talked about training a little bit. This is pulled straight out of the, the California's workplace violence law. General and personal safety measures, how to recognize the potential for violence, the assault cycle, characteristics of aggressive violent patients and victims, strategies, uh, verbal intervention, de-escalation techniques, physical maneuvers. That to me has probably been the biggest uh, saving grace We've actually seen our incident rates uh, significantly reduce through this training uh, for the staff now to be able to calm down before it rises to that level. Um, and we actually took that a step further. When we, when we look at hiring for our security officers, uh, I had a manager who was very prone that we wanted to hire uh, ex-law enforcement, military, six foot two, 220 
uh, guys who probably live in a gym. And while I say that there's a need for those individuals, because uh, that's who you want when you know someone's getting assaulted to come in and help out. Uh, I have an officer, her name's Miss Jones. She's probably in her 50s. Um, and she has the best rapport with anybody who's super not happy that day. She's able to come in and automatically, nine times out of 10, probably 9.9 .9 out of 10, diffuse that situation. Because culturally in our community, when she walks in, they, they visualize their mom or their grandma. And for whatever reason, it just automatically brings them down because there's no way in the world uh, in that neighborhood they would ever talk to their mom or grandma in that manner. So when she walks in, you know, that patient might be yelling, screaming, hollering, hooting, doing the whole nine, not happy. And she just walks in nice and calm and says, hey, how's, how's it going today? It seems like, you know, you're not having a, a good day. What can I help you with? And automatically, you just, you just feel the tension leave the room. Whereas my six foot two, 220 guy that lives in the gym walks in, he could say the exact same thing, but all it is is we're going to fight because I don't like you and we're going to go. I'm pretty sure I can take you. So let's go. Uh, so I would say keep that in mind when you're talking about who, you, who you're hiring and this training about verbal intervention and de-escalation because that person, uh, they represent, you know, everyone has a history, a story, where they're coming from. Uh, having a different person, a different option, sometimes is a good uh, de-escalator. Appropriate, inappropriate use of restraining techniques. Uh, CMS has some great guidelines about uh, restraint applications. Our security does not uh, do restraint applications. We assist the clinical staff. Um, so we might come in and help hold the patient down and get the, the restraints on. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's the clinical staff that are, are actually applying those restraints, checking them, getting the doctor's orders and stuff like that. Um, then we're talking about resources. Uh, so here, here's some good ones, and I'm, I'm a big proponent. Uh, OSHA has the Guidelines for Preventing Workplace Violence. Uh, I believe it's 3147. Um, but if the middle one, the Oregon Association of Hospitals Research and Education Foundation, this is probably, to me, one of the, the best resources you can find when it comes to workplace violence. It, this whole entire kit has a step-by-step -step, uh, roadmap, I should say, on how to develop a workplace violence program. They did this in conjunction um, with the Nurses Association up there, and it's actually um, evidence-based. So they actually conducted a study on how they implemented this, tracked the trends. Um, so it's not just, you know, we, we all got in a room and came up with some good ideas. They actually did the science behind it and determined that this is a good process. Um, and I'm talking, it has everything. It has a draft policy. It, it talks about how to form a committee, who should be on the committee, the tool to conduct an environmental risk assessment, um, meetings, uh, annual evaluations, signage. Uh, literally, you could go to this website, print it off, and have everything you probably need uh, within a couple weeks to implement a program off of that. And then uh, IHSS, uh, this is the spring handbook from a couple years ago, but our security industry guidelines. Um, so I recommend your security team probably should be involved in this organization. Uh, I'm a member of quite a few, uh, but this one with the healthcare specific focus uh, really brings solutions that I think are unique to our environment. Uh, and their guidelines essentially give you the foundation when you're creating those policies for that department um, on what it should look like. We, we rely on the same. Um, they've got good, um, we're starting to get into um, certification through IHAS for our officers, so there's different levels. It's as uh, easy and tactical and cheap as less than 100 bucks to sign up, study a little bit, take a test, get a certified officer. They've got things that you can achieve, like programs of distinction. I mean, it is what's recognized in the industry for healthcare safety uh, and security as, as the leader. Uh, so that was one of the big initiatives we did. We, we became a program of distinction at MLK. 70% uh, of the staff, that's the minimum requirement, has to be a, a certified uh, healthcare security officer, supervisor. The manager, director needs to be a certified healthcare protection administrator. Uh, and I'll be honest, when I went to risk and told them we were doing this, they were super happy because they called the insurance company as well. And we're actually able to get a reduced rate uh, from our insurance carrier uh, because we were able to attain this certification. Okay. I'm not going to say like all insurance companies will probably do that for you, but it, uh, definitely you know, when I'm trying to sell stuff to the C-suite, 
uh, being able to reduce that kind of cost was a, was a big win. The foundation, so I'm a board member of the foundation. Uh, we do a lot of research, a lot of research. So every year we do a crime survey. Uh, so essentially we pull hospitals and determine what, what's crime looking like. Are we trending up? Are we trending down? What type of crime are we seeing? Uh, violence is up. Theft is down. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, and then we do a good evidence-based research like reducing violence toward healthcare workers, the value of at-risk patient screening. Uh, we have a, a paper that just got published uh, on Friday uh, that talks about um, workplace violence. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of information out there yet. So there, there's no statistics you're gonna be able to pull and say, hey, having a workplace violence program uh, will reduce violence. It, it doesn't show that right now. Uh, actually, as soon as you implement it, you will see an increase in your statistics. Because as with anything, the more you educate your staff, all of a sudden now they know what to look for. Now they're gonna report that. Whereas before, I guarantee you walk into any nurse's station and someone will say, well, that's just part of the job. Been here 20 years, been happening forever. That's just, that's nursing. Um, and it shouldn't be. So I'd, be, I'd be interested to hear from anybody that um, Maybe we didn't speak about something that you're doing. Um, I'll bring the microphone over here. Yeah. We have a statewide hospital association, which also has a general liability uh, insurance kind of business. And they sponsor SEPTEP training, which is great for facilities. Yeah. And they also have, uh, <clears throat> they also will sponsor on behalf of hospitals uh, in, uh, risks reviews and uh, crime prevention experts to come in and, and tour the facility, look at policies, and work with us to make sure we have good crime prevention programs. Yeah, so SEPTED certified, you know, what does it stand for? Environmental crime, design? Crime prevention through environmental design. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's the people that you want at the table with your SD reviews. <laughs> Thinking about the tree not being you know, shorter than six foot, the bush not taller than two foot, um, two means of egress for the, for the reception person, all those kinds of things. Here. I hope no one else has to do what we're doing. We actually have been approved to have our own armed police force yeah. for Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Uh, we've tried everything. It's been through a lot of uh, study, and this seemed to be the place to go. And it's augmenting our security force. It's not going to get rid of our security uh, staff. They're, it's just going to be augmenting that. And there's different ways to think about that. There's um, some systems that will be heavily armed. Some, some have no firearms. Um, at my previous employer, we kind of went in the, in the middle. We had a policy upon which uh, leadership in security and a cohort of trained and certified and, and whatever people that we had um, designated here went through a process reviewed extra by HR and risk and myself. Um, and, and they were allowed to carry a firearm, but they're only allowed in the parking decks, outside the hospital, and then if they have to respond to a non-life-threatening call inside the hospital, they actually have to put the, the firearm in the back of their squad car or in the uh, armory, if you will, before they go respond to the call. Officers hated that last part because of response time. Um, and it just depends where you're at, the type of uh, risks you have, the culture you have, the quality of the officers they have. Um, I certainly would not advocate for firearms in just any officer's hands. Um, and just speaking about the officers, um, you know, depending which market you're in and how you're um, recruiting for officers can depend on the quality of the candidates you get. Um, we've, we've had some instance where in some of our busiest ERs with the highest rate of, of workplace violence, we had the, some of the youngest, least trained officers covering shifts in the ED just to to have somebody there. And I can't tell you how disheartening it is when you hear feedback that, um, I mean, literally a story where an officer, very young in his career with us, said to a nurse, well, when you get punched, I'll come help. Wow. You know, how, how can you? How's how can that you, supportive, yeah. Yeah, and, and all my kids are older than that now, but they all went through that age, and I can see, well, my kid probably would have said that, you know, at that age. So. Um, Training is hugely important, especially if you're going to entertain the idea of a firearm. I'm a huge believer in the effectiveness of tasers. I can't tell you how many times that our officers have responded to a situation in a patient room 
patient's going through um, uh, an episode of whatever and becomes violent um, verbally and physically and goes into the, here's an example, patient goes into the, to the room, the restroom in the, in the patient room and uh, is pushing a, a knife into his chest, um, attempting to hurt himself significantly. To have an officer respond in that confined area has an, an inherent risk. The taser was deployed. The whole time the family members are watching this. And at the end of that episode, because we resolved it with the use of a taser, a non-lethal approach, uh, the family members are actually hugging our officer, thanking us for that intervention and that approach. And you don't really think about tasers in that way necessarily, but in healthcare, um, you know, you sort of have a progression of force. Firearms are probably at the top, but you'd want to have a taser before that as a, a, a less lethal force. So I'm a huge believer in the effectiveness of tasers when they're trained properly, uh, when the officers are trained properly. Any additional questions? Okay. Well, I want to thank you guys for, uh, for, for leading a nice presentation and discussion here. Thank you very much.